Carpe Diem VPN. Seize the network. Hey there, it's uh, Tim with Carpe Diem VPN, back for another SD-WAN uh, design video. And I'm joined by a good friend of mine, David, who works for Verizon as a principal engineer. And um, we've been doing this for a long time, haven't we, <laughs> David? It's been, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were both uh, pretty much since the since Viptela became a, a household name, if you will. We've both been uh, slinging packets with the uh, Viptela stuff. So um, everybody knows me, but uh, and I'm sure pretty sure most people already know you. But if you would do me the uh, the honor of uh, yeah. introducing yourself, well, maybe some people wouldn't recognize me because I combed my hair today, but <laughs> 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 okay. but. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a very active member of the community, at least for saying things in well in Twitter. So you would hear me or read me talking about well, pretty much SD one or routing or design or just recruiting some morbid joke because that's also another thing I like to do. But well, it depends what which are you're interested in, in. You know, when you get into Twitter and. Uh, well, other than this, the, yes, I work as a consulting engineer. So in general, I just get to know a customer, talk to them, then discuss exactly what they need, or what what's it what's it that they want to achieve with SD one, and then talk them through it. Okay, so help them to get there. I have been in situations in which the customer just bought SD one, and they have absolutely no clue about it because for them it was just replacing one box for another. So they many customers still have this thinking about let's make the new thing work the old way and that's actually <laughs> horrible true, because true. then it, it is uh, it, it is well it gets complicated because then you you get to this well cognitive dissonance in which you believe something should be done this way and then the customer asks but why <laughs> and then it, is this a ping pong about no dude, don't do that then, well part of mm -hmm. being a consultant engineer is being a good listener sitting with them and then We'll convey the right information, talk them through it, and we'll show them that you can get better, you can get to a better place and achieve some, well, business outcomes as if you understand where you are and where you want to be. Also, it involves, well, you can do this in another way. You can, in, in, uh, sorry, you can integrate these two with another, like SD1 umbrella, like SD1 using advanced security features, like as the one and maybe something with the API because you want to have a different dashboard showing you different things. But some people don't know this. Some even some engineers don't know things that you can do by integrating tools and but only knowing the fundamentals. So this is well this is my job now. So I just tell people how they can do it better and well in the process of it actually learn much more because sometimes customers come with some random question and then I have to investigate this amount of papers so i so i can justify my no <laughs> but it's part of the the position i love it honestly i love to talk to people i i love the the human connection that you can put into technology when you talk to them and it's not just about hey look at these commands and look at what they do but rather what do you want to do let's talk through yeah. it and and putting this this humanity where, where we need to have it because it's not just about ones and zeros is it is how do we interact and how do we get to a common agreement and things like that. And well, this is the way anyway that I've met you or I met some other people. This <laughs> just through a little of this humanity into technology. That's what we do. Yeah, no, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. And honestly, that's why I started doing the this design thing is because uh, I wanted to get out of the ones and zeros and start moving towards Mm -hmm. well, why do we do it at all? Like, why, why do we use this solution? What does the solution do for me? And then, of course, what's the best way to use the solution? So, mm -hmm. or is there, or is, what is the quote unquote best practice? Which, of course, we know best practice varies wildly on the network and the requirements and all of this, right? So, um, um, but anyway, <laughs> best practices are the, they, they have, well, in general, best practices are these 80 20 rules that so they will catch 80% of mm -hmm. the cases. That's right. But the other 20, which is unsurprisingly, the most of the cases that you would see <laughs> don't fit. <laughs> so, it's so true. <laughs> you're like, ah, oh, this is true. a corner case, and suddenly, wait, but that was a corner case on the other customer. And in the other customer, ah, uh, damn it. 
So, <laughs> How, yeah, what, what's the number at which the stuff being a quarter case? Like, <laughs> do, we, do we tick the box enough times? Oh, uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> Just stop calling them corner cases because it makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, so, we are here today uh, to talk about firewalls, to talk about NAT and firewall rules, and just generally how firewalls and security appliances um, get both both enable and in some cases maybe disable or or make it harder the business of putting together an SD WAN fabric. Um, and as a as a, a rubric, if you will, I have my lab that I've been building um, that I talked with Chris last time about our control connections. We touched briefly on the firewalls. Specifically, we were talking about control connections in that case. We were talking about how we can get MPLS control connections or, or whatnot off the MPLS over the internet through a firewall. And, and, and we had a couple other things. But I wanted to have a whole session where we just talk about firewall, the NAT rules, and just the considerations that we have to be aware of um, for it. And so I'm gl so glad that you could join me for this because um, it's going to get, I'm sure we're going to get in the weeds a little bit. I'm going to try to keep us somewhat focused on design, but some of the stuff you just got to dig in, uh, you know, with the very specific use cases where the firewalls can get in the way. So uh, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and I'm going to, and you and I, let's just go over to the diagram mm -hmm. and just start talking through it. Let's go. So let's go ahead and take a packet walk and just, and just kind of remind ourselves of what the problem was last time. So last time, again, the MPLS router could not reach the SD-WAN controllers, so we added our MPLS underlay router to provide that connectivity. And what that means is that when branch one sends a, a packet over the MPLS to the controllers, that packet will go over the MPLS, and I'm originating a default route into the MPLS from both underlay routers in the data centers. So it'll pick one of the two, but let's just say in this case it's going to go this way. So the packet will go to the MPLS underlay router, which will route it to our firewall, and then our firewall will perform the NAT, the network address translation that will change it from a private MPLS address to a specific overload um, NAT address. And then that will then go over whichever transport it wants and off to the controllers. So that's the change we made from the last video is the ability for the MPLS to hit the controllers. And by the way, that's gonna happen at the other data center because this was the no NAT. But yes. Oh, that's a good. <laughs> actually, actually, no, no. That's a no, no. You actually pointed out something very important, right? So, so, so. No, you're absolutely right. So, actually, what happened here? Uh, I apologize. I, I I forgot to talk about this. This is a good, good, very good catch. Very good catch. So, what actually happens here? I, I said the NAT was here. It's not. It's here. So that's, that's true. In this data center, in this data center, I put the NAT here. So that's a very good catch. Um, I put the NAT here because of that reason. Because we don't have a NAT in the in there so that's a no nat dmz now over here is where i did it where the control packet will go through the mpls re retain the private address and then hit this firewall and be natted so thanks for keeping me honest on that that's a, that's a very good point no it was uh, funny when they say that oh it was gonna be <laughs> natted and they say no nat oh shit the guy's violating all the things but <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I so full full, full disclosure. Um, after we talked to Chris, after I talked to Chris, it's been now two weeks, I think. Right? Uh, I did all this work, and then I promptly forgot exactly how I did it. So, <laughs> very good catch. Been there. All been right. There. So, um, <laughs> well, having but... said that, mm -hmm. uh, having said that, that's just one of the considerations that we have to to think about when we're talking about what are bringing firewalls into the into the uh, picture. So what we haven't really talked about, and what I'd love to talk about with David today is, among other things, is this idea of each data center has two SD-WAN routers, and two SD-WAN routers are connected to the NAT or no NAT DMZ, so the firewall. And then the firewall is connected to multiple internet transports. Let me clean up this diagram a little bit so we can talk about it. Um, give me just a second to pick the eraser here. Let me erase that a little bit so, so we can mark it up better, and I'll let... I'm David, glad they can't it up see my. Better. I'm glad they can't see my ugly oh, drawing before when I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, yeah. So, so what? Now, now there's a there's a bit of a lie here on the diagram. The diagram makes it look like there's actually two interfaces going to the firewall. This is not the case. This, this is, is actually interfaces, right? This is actually sub interfaces. So what we have here 
is each s 2 router has one physical interface going to the to, to the firewall and it's a sub interface i think actually how we've done it is like biz internet is vlan 11 and pub internet is vlan 12 or or oh, dot one q encapsulated yeah. 12. and then when we hit the firewall uh the firewall is basically just routing the packets for us and mm -hmm. so i would like to talk about a little bit now that's how i've that's how i've designed it mm -hmm. i'd like to i'd like to ask uh, David, given given this setup, just that we have two SD WAN routers, firewall, no NAT DMZ, firewall connected to both transports, you know, like what what advice or what, what would your suggestion be about how like, how you might do a design like this well, from an uh, underlay the, perspective? The first thing I would add is what I would uh, ask. I was going to ask is, do you have a T-log extension between those routers? Is it true? I do not. Oh. Okay. And, I, and and there's a reason for that, right? And it's because each of these routers is connected to both tra all three transports. Yeah, yeah. That's so yeah, it depends on how you want to deploy, but that's correct. You could have the two like, extension if they are yep. not connected to both transports, but if all of them are connected to all the transports, then the two like, extension is doing nothing there. So some people put a switch in front of them, but yep. I would say that just that just, I'd say, single point of failure to the design, and uh, I, I wouldn't go that route, honestly. <laughs> so it, it really okay. depends on if you want to take the risk or not. But again, that was for Tila extension, so I just went around the whole topic. For the firewalls, though, let me just try to zoom in a little. So, oh, in, uh, I mean, I mean, oh, you may have to, uh, I might have to zoom in for us since I'm the one presenting this. Hold on. Oh. We can zoom in a little bit. And remember that, of course, those are two, not too physical. It's more like a logical, right? The, yeah. the, the physical is that black line, and then the logical yeah. is the, No, that's is okay. The anyway, if it's logical, it, it is correct, because you would have to end the connection to the firewall, irrespectively of being a T-log extension, sorry, a sub-interface or not. It's okay. Okay, what I generally see in in this type of design, or, or, or the common design I'd say is that the firewall would be connected to some sort of internet switch usually, so this mm -hmm. we're facing mm -hmm. the, the, the edge, and the SD1 router is going to be connected to that switch. So it's going to be the SD1 router, then the internet switch, and then the firewall. No, it, you, that's a good point. So, no, that's actually a very good point. I, I, I want to, for those who might not be able to visualize it really well, let me, let me kind of... And, and you could draw this too, actually. You've got certainly access oh. to do it. But, but let me make sure I'm understanding. Because I agree with you. This is this is the more common actual implementation. I'm doing this because I'm in a lab. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. actually that common to connect your firewall directly to your transport, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's normal that your transport actually is going to end up in some kind mm -hmm. of aggregation, a WAN aggregation switch. That's and then correct. you're going to use VLANs or, or, or something mm -hmm. to break that out, to send that to the firewall on the outside and then and then bring it back in on the inside or set up a DMZ VLAN, where, which is mm -hmm. what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to stop annotating. I'm going to let you annotate yep. a little bit. No, but it's I, a, but that's, yeah. That's the common thing. In general, some people even do in this interconnections between the SD1 boxes and the firewalls. So here, I just don't want to make a, a mess of it. You can erase uh, what I've drawn, by yeah. the way, and, and, and annotate mm -hmm. on top. Yeah. Uh, so people in general, what they do is that they use some slash 31 range, and then they just, they just simulate that I, they are just connecting towards the switch, ignoring totally that there's a firewall behind, uh, or, or just ignoring that the switch is there, and they just try to connect to the firewall instead. Mm -hmm. So the, the switch is just doing the... Well, but the switch the switching. A lot of switching. That, that, that's yeah. very much it. But they want to ignore it, and that's okay as well. It's up to whatever you want to do on it. The, the trick on this is how do you then perform the NAT? Because what becomes complicated when you have NATing scenarios is the ranges that you're using for NATing, if it's a mm -hmm. slash 30 or slash 29 or whatever you get assigned, doesn't matter. And to which provider does that belong to? If it's yes. a provider independent or if it's a provided, uh, sorry, provider assigned range. Because if that's the case, then do you want to understand that SD1 has was born from the premise that the space that you would use in general would be yours and you can fumble around, you can play with it. But if it's just depending on the provider, then it will place some restrictions. Although in general, those restrictions are gonna be healthy <laughs> because uh, let me just put it another way. If you're using a provider, uh, provider, sorry, I'm brain farting here, provider independent range, yeah, then you can 
you can get into shady scenarios where things don't work and you don't know why because you would as most probably you would just advertise the same range in both of the clouds and that's bananas <laughs> because... it's, it's funny that you bring this up because literally <laughs> when chris and i were talking last time about the the control connections this is exactly the scenario we were running or that we started talking about was the exact same thing you just observed right if i'm using provider independent space and i'm announcing it to multiple providers I can't be deterministic about my traffic flow for the colors, right? Mm -hmm. So no, that's 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 great. That's a great observation. It, it, be, it becomes complicated. And then, well, the other thing is, if you have a provider assigned range, then then you have also to understand how do you make that work with MPLS? Who is the provider giving you or or allowing you to use the MPLS service? And also, if you can then use a public range in MPLS and then put it or advertise it into these internet well the into the default free zone if they allow you just to put that on the internet here um i see you gesturing a lot which is which is oh. great um let, let's, get, <laughs> let's help sorry. everybody else out let's help everybody else out <laughs> erase sorry. erase what yeah yeah let's let's because i think i think it's important i think what you're saying is extremely important and i want to make sure we for the people that can't visualize it themselves like that we can kind of show them a little bit yeah my apologies let me just try to find the eraser Oh, oh, I got you. Hang on. Hang on. I mean, you don't need all the I got, I got the, uh, I got the tablet and the pen and all of that, so it's a little easier, easier for me, right? So, okay, there. Okay, good. So, let me just move around here. So, yeah, I think. I'm sorry, let's go back to so, the pen here. No, so if you have a provider, uh, let me see how. So did our okay. So maybe this was gonna work. If you have then a provider independent range, it means that it could be advertised this way or this way. So it mm -hmm. means that your traffic is gonna come inbound this direction or this direction because it doesn't belong to any provider. So as it depends on you advertising it through one right. or another. So right. it, it's gonna depend on what you have here in the in the firewall. Okay, let me well, and just that. yeah, are we are we doing something like uh, like primary back in uh, secondary where we're advertising specific uh, something specific to oh. well you could but it depends on the range because in general you cannot do anything smaller than slash 24 right so, exactly so, so it, it, it irrespectively of you advertising a slash 30 29 27 if the provider is going to aggregate into slash 24 then well you're doomed there's no difference <laughs> no you're absolutely right so if we are um if we only have a slash 24 and it's provider independent then there's no we can't do uh, traffic engineering in a way where we send, like, say, more specific advertisement to exactly. one provider. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely true. So we'd have to do something else. And and I've seen and I've done this in the wild in, in when I was an enterprise engineer, and it's maybe like sixty forty like works some of the time. Is you could do something where you AS prepend to one provider over another, but like the truth is that there's so many hops out there on the internet that some people are still going to see that as the shortest path. It's a little ugly, right? Um, well, it is, yeah, a, no. it, it is an undeniable consequence of the internet being an, an, an unstructured, where I would say a, not, a non-hierarchical net. Right. So, right. So, so if the internet has no hierarchy, then it will, it is unlikely that some things would work. So we will have to stick with the well, with the principle of either slash 24 or if you have something bigger or smaller, we can play around that. But if not, then, well, you have to find some other ways. Yeah, agreed. It's And it makes it really complicated. Um, using provider independent space makes it really complicated for your underlay is what I mean, mm -hmm. for your underlay. It makes it complicated uh, uh, in multiple ways, right? Like now, for example, if I send something out of my biz internet color, so, so my SD-WAN router thinks it's going to, you know, sends... Uh, some provide if I'm using provider independent space from my from SD WAN router, and I send a packet out, and I'm saying it's color biz internet, and even if the firewall, even if it even if it, the firewall forwards it to the biz internet color, like that provider, whatever AT and T or Verizon or whoever mm -hmm. it is, we have no expectation or understanding that it can come back the same way. Yeah, to the, the same path, provider. The, the path is complicated, and also that could break some applications that could because the path is not the same one you may have a difference in quality of experience as well so right. it becomes tricky trying to regulate the internet which is the wild wild west yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. so well that that's one of the downsides of having provider 
independent ranges. In general, you would want to be conscious of this. Now, let me just, can you help me with the eraser? I just, oh, I, hang on, hang I on, don't on. seem to find it. So, uh, now we should be then jumping into provider uh, assign ranges. Yeah, so let's talk, let's talk, yeah, so let's talk about provider assigned, which is probably a lot cleaner for this purpose, for this SD-WAN yes. purpose. Yes. Yeah, well, now, talking about provider assigned ranges, it becomes easier, and at least for our case, it's it's a better way, or at least a clear way to do it. Why? Well, because in, in SD-1, if you have several transports, specifically internet, which is going to be the, I think, the most complex one to try to influence, then you want to find a way to make each one of those transports independent. So what, what I try to convey with this is that if you can have then a provider assigned range that would then tie whatever the traffic you're going to use for those or, or source or, or, or mm -hmm. simply the, the traffic that is going to be related to those IP addresses to these only transport, then that's going to help you also then to, to segregate this. Huh? So if yep. you have... And you're going to come back the same way, right? To have yeah, it come so back if you have way. a particular range that you advertise this way out of the firewall, for each one of those providers, then there is no way that if I come out this way, uh, I am I am gonna use pop internet. I would rather just come this way. Most probably get to the well. It depends on how you have your policy. If it goes to the firewall and then back, <laughs> or if you just do something like this, but you would not then use the other transport in the wrong way, or at least right. you wouldn't simply mix them, and that would right, make it right. easier to handle. Though that, now. Uh, on top of this, then, the other thing to consider when you have well, this type of scenarios in which the nothing is being performed, then who is doing the NAT? Is the VH doing the NAT? Is the MPLS router doing the NAT? Is the firewall doing the NAT? Mm -hmm. So where's your visibility over those three cases? And, and why did you want to have visibility over those? So, assuming you have a an MPLS router, and this is a common deployment, it's just mm. not that cheaper. <laughs> not as cheap. Right. As yeah, that's that's <laughs> the thing is that a lot of people don't want to buy new routers or they don't want to. So I get that, right? But it definitely makes it a lot of a simpler, a lot more of a simple deployment. It simplifies the deployment significantly, right? Yeah. So if we you, talked a little bit. Yeah. About that. If you do on prem. You can do it. You can just have a massive server that anyway is going to be running your controllers or something. And then you would just put a CSRV there doing all the magic. And mm -hmm. that's the that's the case I have seen most mostly, honestly, when it's on-prem, of course. So what do you do? You have this MPLS router, and the MPLS router is going to have three routing tables. So it's going to have the global routing table, the routing table mm -hmm. that you might use for management, and then the routing table that you would use for the internet connection. Actually, four, because then you would have the one for MPLS. So then, Wait, are we, talk, are we talking about... So you're talking about, like, when we... Oh, okay, so we're talking about if you were to do an on-prem yes. uh, controller installation. Yeah, well, okay. Actually, if you would do... Uh, not on-prem controller, but if you would then use these router to not... Again, I... I, I okay, I got, I, you, I got the, you. I just mix it up because I apologize. If you have an on-prem okay. controller, and, and you use a bunch of... Well, if you have a massive UCS server doing all this, then you, you can just you put a CSRV and then put some jigs of your, of, well, of your, I would say, processing power and then just run a virtual device. You don't need to put a new box for this. You would just use okay. the box you have. Now, when talking about this MPLS router here, then, what mm -hmm. is this router going to have? I'm, I'm just segue over it. My apologies. So yeah, no, it's going to have several routing tables. And you have the MPLS routing table. Um, I apologize because I'm just using the mouse. You have the internet routing table, you have the global routing table, and you have a routing table that you most probably would use for management. Mm. Now, what the router is going to do is that it's going to, in general, what I see is this term that for some people still causes shivering is VASI. Oh, VRA yeah. aware service yep. interface. Seems yep. like nobody likes it. Or VRA for work. <laughs> yes, that, that, it's it's not on a stick. I, I never understood yeah. the on a stick type of discussion, but it's hilarious. So what you would have then is this most probably you have an IP address that comes out of one routing table, lands into Bossy, and then Bossy mm -hmm. will do the not on a stick translation and then it gets advertised to the internet. Oh, and the then the, VRF, yeah. Yes, and then in this internet VRF would be the one connected to the not to the firewall here. Yep. So 
so it would depend on how your deployment is, but in general, this is a common deployment on-prem. You would have a, a CSR doing all the magic with a bunch of routing tables and then NAT in a stick. If you don't have the NAT in the firewall, because then the NAT is going to happen on the MPLS underlay router, this guy here. Yeah. Yep. If it, is, if it happens in the, in the firewall, then we're talking about this guy. Yep, which we're gonna we're we're gonna go over there, and we're gonna definitely dig in on that as well for sure. For so, sure. If, so if it happens in the in the firewall, then in the right then, well, first you have some pros and cons. One of the pros is that you would have the visibility over the firewall. The con is that well, depending depending on the firewall and whatever the deployment you have, then how many of these interfaces can you test into this? How many sub-interfaces are you going to use? Can you use sub-interfaces or not? Can you use physical interfaces? And also then in which way you're going to advertise this out? Then if it's uh, if what you have with your provider, there's some default rod maybe, if you have BGP, if you have any other well, way in which you would advertise and and, and get this connectivity towards your provider cloud. And you would need then to understand or to know to which of them you would advertise a, or use a particular range that uh, belongs to their network. And also, another of the considerations, and I think it's the, the last one that we would have to touch on, is not necessarily internet, but how MPLS interacts with each one of these transports. Because or, ideally, or <laughs> I, 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 in general, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. But, but it depends on how your controllers are deployed. And that's, uh, we are getting back into deployment and controllers. But <laughs> in, yeah, general, yeah, no. then, in general, then, how do you deploy your controllers? If you're going to deploy the controllers in the cleanest way, which is all of them get a public IP address. And then you would advertise those four IP addresses that you would use. Mm -hmm. into a, the internet and then the question is in the into the internet cloud of which provider do you want to use one on top of another do you want to use both so these are the things you would want to consider that's one thing another is maybe you don't want to put a public ip address into all the controllers you want to put it only in v1 which is actually the only one that is mandatory to have is the only one that yeah. is that is required all the others don't need a public ip address you can just put anything, but then we are. Well, you gotta, you gotta have a NAT. So you have to have a NAT for them somewhere, though, right? Because <laughs> exactly. somebody on the internet colors has to be able to reach it. Um, exactly. So the, the yeah. thing is that each time we involve NAT, we get into into the discussion of which flavor of NAT you are using, mm -hmm. which IP addresses and ports you are using, and if it's gonna work or not. Because simply some flavors are not done work. Uh, simply when you mix yeah. them, because there are several variations. There are about eight of them, maybe. You have full cone NAT, restricted cone. Then you have, I think, is a dynamic NAT, and it had another fancy name that is related with a cone as well. Apologies, I don't remember <laughs> the, the names, but it, it's yeah. a cone, a so restricted this is, one or a full one or whatever. <laughs> this, is a, this is a good, uh, this is actually good, because most people that uh, come into Viptela actually are familiar with the Cisco specific NAT terminology and not the Viptela. I want to say Viptela, but I think Viptela, it's not even necessarily Viptela specific. I want to say it's more like non Cisco or, or more yeah. like open industry. Uh, the, the restricted no, you know, symmetric NAT or symmet uh, symmetric cone and asymmetric cone and full cone. And, and all of these are, are terms that most of the people, you know, watching probably don't aren't familiar with. Um, so let me show you how I have it. How I set it up because I wanted to get them on board. I wanted to onboard my, my routers, and okay. and then you could just tell me like how how mm. badly I did basically, uh, <laughs> or or you know or how you would change it or how you would change it. So how I did it here, I already I already kind of oh here let me change this back to pen here so I don't erase everything. Um, so how I did this was of course in this case I use sub interface and I. Um, gave an IP address on each color to the, you know, to, I, I think I actually, how I did this is this, uh, just for, so we can actually have something to talk about. Like, so I think I did 119.19.10.0.24. I did dot 11 and dot 12 is how I, how I numbered it, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. So here, you know, for this color, I gave this, uh, you know, like 12 dot X and I gave this 12 dot 
X, right? So so public mm-hmm. IPs on that color, right? So when it goes to the firewall, the firewall is just routing. It's just routing and it's doing um, access control, which we'll talk, we should hit on as well, the access control pieces and what needs to be allowed and, and the pain of, you know, mm-hmm. infosec teams that don't allow certain types of traffic, right? <laughs> um, so, so, and then I did like, you know, dot 11 dot X here. So, mm-hmm. so, so that's how I did it in the known at DMZ. And the, the firewall routing table is actually very simple, right? So it's literally uh, just saying, you know, IP route. And then for these subnets, for the, which I think I actually I think how how I did this was I packaged them. So for each transport, I I used a slash I think I used a slash twenty eight, or maybe it was a twenty seven. I have to go look. Um, but the point is, so it would be contin- contiguous. So like twelve dot x twelve dot x. Those, these would be contiguous subnets, so that I could package them, and then advertise them to the provider that way. This so this is the same way provider assigned would work as well. So provider assigned, they would assign you Mm -hmm. a block of IPs Mm -hmm. and then the provider wouldn't actually need you to advertise their own space to them. But this being a lab, I, I, that's how I did it with BGP Mm -hmm. or no, I I didn't, I did a static route here because of that, because the provider that assigns you space is not going to need to have you announce their own routes back to them via BGP. Right. Yeah. It's going to be aggregated later anyway. Right. They're going to aggregate it in their network and they're going to say the next top is your firewall or your, or whatever it is. Right. So that's, so that's how the IPsec and control connections are built in the known at DMZ. The firewall is literally just IP route XXX sending, you know, biz uh, pub traffic that way and biz internet traffic that way. Now there is a interesting conundrum, if you will, which is where is the, what is the default route point to on your firewall? If you have multiple internet providers and and if you have multiple colors coming into that firewall, how are we, or can we even, determine to which color we're going to build our IPsec if we're using a, a default route pointing at both providers? Well, do, do you see the, con- a, the concern? I understand. That's a tricky one because I think that uh, I would, uh, I think it would be then a tough call from inbound, oh, sorry, from the inside, so from the firewall. I think it's going to be easier to see it from outside. So it would depend on which one is the source. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you would then have to well, put some particular policy in which you would send traffic through this exactly. link if these conditions, because if it's outbound to, towards the internet, you usually don't care. Usually, except when you're trying to build IPsec tunnels over a particular color, right? <laughs> so when you want to preserve the color, and the reason, of course, to preserve the color is so that we can get our telemetry and get our BFD probes and our quality measurement across that color, right? To see how 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 nice is pub internet having a day, or how nice is the day for pub internet today? And if it's half of the packets are going over biz internet, you're not getting a, a good picture of the mm-hmm. of the color, right? So no, that's exactly the that's exactly the concern is is if you just load balance via zero routes, you know, it's 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 a little harder, right? You almost have to be much more granular. In your routing table uh, to do that, so that was that was something. Um, the other thing was, uh, let me think. So that's how I did it in the Nonat DMZ. It's actually mm-hmm. very very simple in the Nonat DMZ well, to do it this way. There's another thing I wanted also to bring up is okay. uh, uh, because I mentioned that it would be also depending on how they see it from outside. So right. in which way then are you attracting the traffic towards the controls? Are you using a DNS name that is mapped to either of the IP addresses that you're advertising out in the internet? And one transport oh, the controllers. Yes. Oh, okay. So the controllers actually, let me yeah. zoom out it a is, bit. The controllers no, no. are actually in the cloud, right? Yeah. In, the, no. in this lab, yes. in this lab at least. Mm-hmm. Well, I They're didn't mean cloud. I didn't mean in this particular scenario, oh, okay. but I, what, what I meant is in general, how do you attract the traffic towards the controllers? It is very common to use a DNS name, mm-hmm. and then this DNS, the DNS name is going to resolve to either of the IP addresses that they would use if yep. it's one transport or another, but then... Yep then it's going to be tricky for you to simply determine which one is going to be the destination, if it's a DNS name, because it can be either. Yep. It can be load balance between both of your public or <laughs> however many public IPs that you have. Agreed. Uh, the good news is, the good news there is at least for control traffic, you don't tend to care that much. Like, what you know, as long as you can reach your controllers and it's a color that you expect to be able to reach the controllers. It's the, IPsec, right. setup. It's the IPsec setup that really matters here. 
right? Yeah. So so bringing it back, um, just to I, I I want everybody to kind of understand the the challenge, and then maybe like some of the solutions that we have. The challenge, of course, is what we've talked about from the beginning when we started talking about provider independent space being problematic. Um, just making sure that we can pin our IPsec source and destination tr- tunnels to the same color, at least as much as is possible through the internet, right? Like as much as is possible through the internet. You mm. might not ride, you know, if you're if you're connected to Cox Business or something, you might ride Cox Business all the way through to the other side. Whereas if you're connected to some third party, you know, small town ISP, you're guaranteed that they're not going to reach all the other way to the other side. You're passing through four other internet providers to get there. You know, you're you're just doing your best to to measure the quality of experience or quality of the applications through that. You know, those two endpoints, right? So, just wanted to kind of tie it together a little bit about what is the actual problem we're trying to solve here, and that's mm-hmm. that's the then, problem. And right? then when talking about data plane, then for IPsec, then we get into the 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 topic of what exactly are you allowing in? Because for the solution to work, then you mm-hmm. would need you would need quite a few number of ports and protocols to be allowed. Not just DNS, but you would need TLS, DTLS, NetConf, STUN, then IPsec, <laughs> BFD, evidently ICMP. Yep. So it, it's quite a lot to consider, especially because the solution uses a different set of ports for the port hopping. It uses one, two, yes. three, forty-six, and then it does a port hopping of a with an offset of twenty. So then it will yep. be one, two, three, sixty-six, one, no. two, three, eighty-six. I think. Let, let's talk about that for a second, because not everybody might not know. Like not everybody who's watching may understand the port hopping thing. So we port hop when we can't make the connection otherwise, right? Like that's the that's the the. It's an automatic feature, mm-hmm. correct? And 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 if we are unable to set up a tunnel, the 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 C edge, V edge, whatever the the WAN edge mm-hmm. assumes that that port might be blocked, and so it automatically jumps mm-hmm. itself mm-hmm. up by twenty ports to try a different set of ports. Right? Is that? Yes. In general, you would see then the. Let me just try to write it down here, bro. If you have a V edge here, I'm just writing a, a hockey puck here. Sorry for the low <laughs> quality, fine. but I'm doing. I'm using a mouse. So. When they try to establish this data plane tunnel, so this is a tunnel, or I'm trying to do it, but I tried. So then you would start with one, I think it's one, two, three, forty-six. It is. It is one, two, three, so forty-six. So in general, stays there. That's the common core that you would see. Now, if it doesn't work for whatever the reason, then we start with offset. The offset is twenty by default here. So if it doesn't work the first time, we will try it again, but it's gonna be sixty-six. Then, if not, it's going to be 86. If not, it's going to yep. be 0, to 6 here. And this is going to be a 4, if I'm not mis- No, sorry. This yeah, one's it, gonna it's be a 5. 5. And yeah, if is, not, yeah. then we're going to back into the first one. So we are going to offset four times till we are back into the first four we used. Correct. It's, it's going to be and, a cycle. And because of that, because that's possible, um, what we need to be aware of for the firewalls, I think is to either allow this or simply oh. make sure that we're allowing some subset of the ports that because if we're if we're allowing one two three four six to go out on the firewall we shouldn't ever actually need to port hop right because that that traffic should be allowed outbound on the firewall and we shouldn't run into a case where we can't set up the data plane unless um unless, unless something it's... else is is broke somewhere else down the line right like so, so yes else is not allowing. But also it would depend who is doing the NAT. <laughs> because if the NAT is happening in the firewall here, then you might have a problem with the number of ports being used. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Absolutely. We should, and we, and we should get to that. You got a very good point there. Um, I was just thinking of the firewall rules, but you're absolutely right. We mm-hmm. need to talk about how does NAT fit into what mm-hmm. ports we're allowing. Exactly. Especially because uh, we could start stepping on each other when we start napping, natting to the same ports, right? Mm-hmm. And you would be just... Yeah. You would use, uh, I think, it's, was it port 500 for IPsec? My apologies for this, yeah. but I do not know. It's 500 remember. and 4500 for NAT traversal. Yeah. Oh, so that's good. I still have so, good memory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you need to get a good deal of ports. Uh, also, you need to add NATConf because of the policies that you'll be pushing through. Assuming that your controls are not in on-prem, well, they are on the cloud. Well, that's not in the that's not in the clear, though, right? We do that over the We do that over the controller tunnel. 
you still yeah would be then over uh let me see the tls or TLS, the TLS or whatever or DTLS. Whatever, whatever it is yeah yeah, yeah. so okay. if you allow just the, the protocol then yes but I mean, there, there are deployments that do that i'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. that that have pri completely private transports where they can do that right yeah it is it, it is well it becomes tricky then to to tying all the required ports that you mm -hmm. use simply because mm -hmm. the solution although it, it is yes automated and it has a lot of well dust uh, uh fancy <laughs> things on top and other sprinkles and all that it's right. it is a, a group of many protocols working together and well one being yeah. a trigger of another so then it yeah. means that you have to consider ipsec bfd icmp and if it's bfd then what kind of VFD are you allowing? In general, it should be a fully VFD section, but some people would argue that it might be just echo, blah, blah, blah. So it, it is complicated then to to determine properly it is. You would have to sit with your InfoSec people and then, well, get to a middle ground. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at the, yeah to... exactly. So at the very least, right, at the very least, we need to allow our DTLS port, one, two, three, four, six, that's just so we can generally get out. Now, when we start natting, we're going to have to actually do more than that. We're going to have to set up port offset. We should talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But certainly to get out, you at least need one, two, three, four, six, because that's what it's going to try off the, or or if you're going to change this, that's fine. Like some InfoSec teams are like, well, that's a well-known port. We'd like you to do something different, right? And so, okay, whatever, like, so let's set our port offset or something. But but generally that's it, right? And that's to set up uh, both of our, both our DTLS and our IPsec are using one, two, three, four, six. Uh, if it, if it can, mm -hmm. right, and then and then uh, or it's trying to use it, and then uh, but you're right, like tunneled within are like all these different protocols, um, and then you know so let me think about that. So that's both for control, that's for IPsec. You need IPsec. We need if you're doing DNS lookup, like you said, if there's some reason you need DNS requests to be able to come in, you know, to to resolve your controller name or something. Obviously, you need to allow DNS mm -hmm. unless you're hosting it outside the company or in the cloud or something, right? So there's a lot of a lot to consider there. Then HTTP or HTTPS, depending on yep. what should be HTTPS though. Then uh, see, so yeah, well, that would be then four for three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but. I'm writing just all these random ports here, but yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna. I actually have a doc. That, uh, <laughs> I need there, no. There's a great doc that Cisco published specifically yes. talking about firewall traversal. Lists all the ports. That's everything you have to take into account. I mm -hmm. will make sure to link it in the in the comment section of the video. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but before I forget about it, I do want to talk about the NAT thing because uh, I think you mm -hmm. hit on an extremely important point. And it's something I've actually been struggling with myself as I've been testing things like cloud on ramp and whatnot and and you know infosec uh, uh you know is a so so okay let's 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 think about that for a second so when you when we're natting so let's just let's step back a second so when we're natting we're going to say like in this case let's say it's a port overload let's say we're doing that we're doing pat and we've got two and we're padding and here it's actually a lot easier to control the underlay being built or the controller which transport we're using because you can set up the net to say, mm -hmm. you know, you come in on here. That's right. And, you know, you net to this specific interface, right? So, like, you're going to come out as, you're, you're definitely going to come out as this color because I'm going to net you to this specific interface, right? So that actually becomes a little easier. We talk about the, how do we make sure we're going out and coming mm -hmm. out in the same way? Like, this is this is one of the ways to do it is to, we can pin the net and say, you're going out this interface if you come in. This, you know, if you come in this interface, you're going mm -hmm. out this, this interface. Anyway, but the problem mm -hmm. is the first router that tries to build a control connection, data plane, whatever, say, let's say this is like router one or router two. Router one starts first. It's going to come out. It's going to see its VBond address or DNS okay. or whatever. And it's going to try to make a connection, one, two, three, four, six. And let's say we allow it. Let's say that firewall rule is allowed. It's going to happen, right? It's going to let it go out and go to the S2 controllers. But what's going to happen when router two boot boots up and tries to make a connection yeah. using a source port of one two three four six? You have to change the it controller. To six, six. So so right. So what what will happen for those who aren't like super familiar with NAT is that gen especially with PAT with port overload or NAT translate uh, NAT overload is that it's gonna the it's gonna multiplex this the and use more or less eat this port and say this port is in use now nobody else can use it. Um, so if another port, if another interface comes in trying to use the exact same NAT and trying to use the exact same port on that interface, 
it's going to say no because I've already reserved that port mm -hmm. for the traffic that this guy sent out. So what will happen is this guy will just never be able to reach the controllers until he tries to do until I, I, we got to get past this thing where we call routers guys or, or, or whatever. I, I, I keep catching myself doing it and I see it and other people do it. And it's just, it's been such a thing in the industry for so long to refer to like, you know, devices as, as mail or something. I don't know. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be better about it. Uh, you know, but anyway, so let's say this router try, you know, it fails. And so what you're saying is true automatically after about what, three minutes or something, it tries the port offset where it will, or the port hop, the port hop is actually different than the port offset. So it'll try 66 and as, assuming that nobody's used 66, that will succeed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we can actually get ahead of this, right? We could actually tell this guy in his config, you want to use one, two, three, four, seven. We can turn on port offset in the config, mm -hmm. and he'll never even it'll never even try to use because we know we know that there are setup here, right? And and tell me if I, you think I'm wrong or if you want to add into that. But you can actually say you will, number two in the template will always use port offset of one, so it will always start with seven, and so they will never step on each other, and that should work. That's a that's a thing we could do, right? It should, but again, as as the upset is going to be a, a limited thing of five different occasions because it's made for five pops. Then, mm -hmm. then uh, it would depend on how many routers you have, how many routers are trying mm -hmm. to access using mm -hmm. that port, and you may get to this mm -hmm. race condition in which it works now for me, but it doesn't work for you. And as soon as I drop it, it works for you, but not for me. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, <laughs> so you absolutely to, true. You have to absolutely. play with this offset. In, in a way that, well, this guy's going to be one, the other guy's going to be two or five, or as long as you keep the offset in separate spaces, you should be able to handle it. We can only offset up to 19 because of the reason of the port hopping every 20, right? So if mm -hmm. I'm going to set up a port offset, I actually can only use, I can only do, I'm not, I'm trying to think of some situation where I would ever have 19 routers or something, 20 <laughs> routers that need to use the same mat, right? That's the, that's that's the point. It's going to be very random, honestly. So. So, yeah. So we we are just here while trying to you know, talk philosophy about this. You might not get into this situation unless you're trying to emulate it in a lab. But I, again, I have could... gotten into this situation. Oh. I believe it or not, I've actually I've actually hit this once, and it was with, and it it was it was actually during when I was creating a D Cloud demo. Actually, the hell it was is that? Uh, D Cloud, Cisco, <laughs> Cisco D Cloud, yeah, yeah, no, D Cloud, the the demos I, that we. But the, I, the problem was. And, I, and meant, I just want to. I meant the situation. Ahead. Like, what the hell is that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Most <laughs> most enterprises will never run into this, right? No, most enterprises will never run into this. But it is possible to run into it. And uh, in my case, the problem was I had one public NAT to work, one public IP to work with, and I'm like four routers. Oh. And so I had to. And this this was the problem: is that uh, the infosec team was not did not open up the extra ports. So we only had one, two, three, four, six to work with. So I couldn't make it work. But you know, so I could set up the port offset. And what happened is. It would get as far as reaching the controllers, which again I had hosted internally. But when it came time to set up uh, connections to the cloud, con to, to the cloud, to the CSRs, I was mm -hmm. using cloud on ramp for IAS, mm -hmm. and uh, it couldn't make the connection because the VBON was like, okay, well, I told them this is where you need to connect, but of course it didn't work because the the port was not allowed, right? The one two three four seven <laughs> eight whatever was not allowed. So I actually did manage to hit this once. Uh, but you're right, most ninety percent at least of enterprises would not run into this condition. I think I wouldn't say this is even a corner case. <laughs> uh, I mean, but but it, it you is could shady. though. If you, it is, it, it is. You could if you ran into a situation where you had multiple routers trying to use the same NAT, you would have to take some precaution mm -hmm. to make sure that they're using different control connections or yes. different uh, ports for the connection. And then you would just open those ports in the firewall. That's the, that's the, that's the caveat, yeah. right? You'd have to open those ports on the yeah. firewall. But you could also decide though, which one of the colors from the SD1 router perspective, you wanted to prefer establishing a control connection over. Because oh no, I'm talking about data plane now. Yes. So I'm just thinking of data plane, oh, but you're right. Apologies. You're right. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct, right? The control connections, you're absolutely right. We could just say, you know what, this is too much work. Let's just use always use uh, this color or something, right? And and then you would just have to, you would still have to do something though because you would step on the same port. You would still have yes. to do some kind of offset. But yeah, for data plane especially, this would be a this was a problem. I can say for sure that it is a problem because I, that's what I ran into. And and so if you had multiple routers, one public net, you would have to do the port offset or or something. You would want to wait for port hopping, right? It works. 
every 20, every three minutes, he would jump another 20 ports. But who wants to sit and wait 10 minutes for their SD <laughs> WAN to work, right? Nobody does. So. You, you do, do clear to clear, and then just, you know, you just you <laughs> right. find your face, and then, oh, yeah, exactly. it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But... <laughs> There's a request command that you can say request port hop, and it'll do it automatically yes. or whatever, but or not automatically, it'll do it manually rather. Um, so, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you start smacking so... the box till it works, and then, oh, look at it, it is working. <laughs> yeah, look, see, I told you it would work. We just had to wait a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> so it will depend on the situation. This is a rare instance of it, but it is. It is rare. It is rare. But yeah, it um, could happen. It just, uh, but just haven't thought about it because, it, well, I think it, it, in general, you don't go down these routes. You try to, well, you, you, you yeah, it, it's it's a it's kind of an El Cheapo route, really, if you think about <laughs> it, right? We're, we're we're trying to reuse the same public IPs. We're trying to reuse the same internet connection or all the same connections. We're mm -hmm. trying to put all the work basically on the config instead of instead of uh, the gear, right? So yes, no, I, I agreed, agreed. But I I I know there are customers that actually do some flavor of this because of 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 whatever the small site or something like this, mm -hmm. right? They don't want to spend the money. Um, but no, so before, I know we've been talking a while, I, I don't want to go too far over because I'm trying to keep these somewhat concise. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot. We've bounced around quite a lot, you and I. Um, I hopefully we, we brought our listeners, <laughs> hopefully we brought everybody along with us oh, man, and yeah. didn't leave anybody in the dust, right? <laughs> um, is there, are there considerations that we didn't have, get a chance to touch on that you think are like really important that we should talk about a little bit? Oh, I'm... Because I feel like we bounced around quite a lot and we hit everything a little bit, or at least to some degree. Yes, we were touching everything, but I, I you cannot think of anything else, honestly, at this point. It, it was just about when do you want a NAT, when you don't, and yep. what happens when you do either of and them. And what kind of NAT, it, what you point out, what, if you do a one-to-one -one NAT, by the way, all this bit about one, two, three, four, seven, and port offset, and stuff, none of that matters. If you do a one-to-one -one NAT, you're specifying like this connection always goes to this router. You don't have to worry about it any well, of that, right? It's a lot so, cleaner. In general, it's a lot cleaner. In general, I've recommended to just do one of one and it's easier because yep. then okay, this is your only entrance point, this is your only access point. So well, if it's only one aisle and you don't have to look yeah. around, then it's very simple, <laughs> right? But but in general, this is the recommended way and it, you're being told all the time. This is the easiest, cleanest, and fastest way to do it. Now, if you want to suffer, this is also supported. <laughs> but it <doesn't> exactly <laughs> exactly if if you want to trade man hours for like uh money they, you know, then, like... and then they tell you then these other three flavors are supported so go ahead <laughs> yeah yeah no this is this has been great i really appreciate yeah. you coming along uh this with me uh just having a discussion again i hope everybody uh, follow it along. I know David and I both tend to b bounce around a lot. So when we get together, we probably bounce around <laughs> twice as much uh, and twice as fast. Uh, but I hope this has been interesting, uh, informative. I would like to know if anybody has any un unanswered questions in the comments specifically. Any, um, any feedback? Did we go too fast? Uh, I hope not. Uh, is there something we didn't cover that we should have covered? Please just let me know down below. I'll put David's uh, Twitter handle in the comments below. Let me um, let's go ahead and wrap this up. All right. Well, dude, that was super fun. Uh, again, I feel like we I feel like we were like bull in a china shop in there, like going over. <laughs> yeah, but it was uh, a lot of stuff. You know what's it's a, painful? It's a complicated that topic. I was I was gesturing and nobody could see that when we were trying to share the diagram. <laughs> you know, well, I kept looking at the camera like. I see David pointing and he's like, <laughs> I see David pointing and he's like, he's, I, I get what he's saying perfectly. And, and I feel like we're leaving everybody behind. So yeah, yeah no, 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 it's dude, fun. that is like, dude, there, the diagram. <laughs> no, no, that was great, man. I really appreciate you coming along with me. This was, this has been excellent. I mean, it's such a complicated topic. It's hard to make it honestly interesting. It's hard to make it engaging. And but it's so important to talk about. Like, man, it's like one of those things where if you don't have to deal with it in your deployment, hey, good for you. Like, congratulations. Somehow you managed to get around it. But if you have to deal with it, man, you really gotta deal with it. <laughs> you know, you have to know how it works. Well, once um, I once I had one deployment in which we had an, an IP address assigned to it by a provider, it was internet provider, and it wasn't working, dude. It wasn't working at all. And this was just Related to this, when BitCheck turns out that they didn't allow uh, DTLS by default in this circuit, 
and the, the, you had this issue that the guy is okay, I have connectivity, I can get to Vivo on, everything is cool, and then, wait, what? <laughs> it's not <laughs> working. I had to do debug and see, and then suddenly you see in the log that, hey, the port is not working, this is, and then suddenly, wait, hold on. <laughs> and then you're back to, are we allowing this protocol or not? And suddenly they come back, well, this wasn't requested. <laughs> That's very true. Um, but, one thing we did, you reminded me actually, one thing we didn't actually talk very much about, but honestly, there's not much to talk about. So I guess we could probably just do it real quick. If your InfoSec team doesn't allow DTLS, if they say we're not going to open up that many ports, like, because it's like 100 ports or something that you should be allowing, mm -hmm. right, for the, the port hopping and port offset and everything. If they just won't do it, you do have the option to force TLS. But it's, I mean, it, yeah, it, but it, it makes it TCP based at that point. Like there's, there's all the things that go on. But hold on. All the yeah. controllers except Vivon support TLS, but Vivon is DTLS Vivon. only. So you will that's need right. it anyway. No, then actually is that, oh, I think you're right. No, yeah, that's a very good point. So yeah, at some point you're going to have to reach <laughs> out to Vivon over DTLS and you're just going to have to do it. Like, you know, so that's a good point. Oh, Okay. So, so that's, <laughs> that, that, I, yeah, that, that just, I just remembered that's, I think that's true. Um, so in that case, people, if you run into this, you got to be able to at least make that, uh, they at least have to let DTLS open to VBond. Like if nothing else, they at least have to let DTLS to that open IP to address. And if to not, then start, then start bringing chocolates and convincing people in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> slip, a, slip a 20 under the door. <laughs> Walk away. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, no, that's, this has been awesome. I really yeah. appreciate you coming along with yeah. me. Um, I'm going to, I've done some work in the lab already just to get basic connectivity up and working so I can like start working on my WAN edges. But based on what we talk about, I'm going to kind of revisit, implement the stuff we talked about. I did mostly what we, I mean, honestly, I think what we came up with is very similar to what I did. I, I'll mm -hmm. go look and see if I even have to change anything. Mm -hmm. Um, we but that's because it's this lab. It's because yeah. it's this lab. Well, not in, because in your lab you can play with things anyway and it doesn't need to be perfect or aligned with everything unless you're trying to demonstrate a particular use case so it would yeah depend that's on your needs. best practice for this lab yes for example also, right like yeah. another so... thing is that we, we also talk uh, when we were off camera of course about some things that we could be talking in another another episode oh like, yeah no. like doing this nothing or doing uh, or, or doing service insertion and then redirecting the traffic to a particular firewall. It could be even the same firewall, just in another completely different villain. <laughs> and <laughs> but doing it on the overlay, not in the underlay, it gets nastier. Sorry, funnier. But well, <laughs> well that's, that's that's a good that's a good point. Um, service insertion with firewalls is is completely supported. It's it's a thing. It's something I hadn't considered uh, with yeah. this lab. I was focusing on firewalls for the underlay, but you're absolutely right. Firewalls yeah. in the overlay could and could exist and could be a thing. Yeah. And service side, not. Oh, you haven't you you haven't seen something nasty till you have to do that. And okay, I, I caused an outage while learning learning about it, <laughs> but but it worked it's, after one outage. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. You you're like. It's been this many days since we caused uh, an outage yes. at server side. Now. Yeah, most probably <laughs> the last outage had my name. So yes, <laughs> the funny thing uh, is that it it happened in, and well, anyway, I don't. I'm not saying the company, but it happened at the CIO's office at the HQ never... in, in EMEA. Dude, I have done so many things in many other offices, but I had to screw up the one where the guy who is. One of the most important people in the company is browsing through, I don't know, maybe Facebook. And he was, of course, frustrated because he couldn't browse. Turns right. out that, well, for several minutes, as the policy was strong, because I overlooked this, the well, default action, accept, reject, don't do it. Always put accept. <laughs> <laughs> very rarely do you put reject. That's very yeah, funny. dude. And then, unless it's a control policy, but for the data plane policy, you in general just yeah. put it as accept because the logic is different. It's not like... When we try to deploy something using a maybe a a uh, I forget the name no 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 a roadmap and then oh, when yeah, the yeah. when the logic doesn't map with the, the doesn't match with the roadmap it just we gets just kicked kept... out <laughs> yeah no in this case it just gets totally rejected so that's what I did and then the traffic was being added to this subset but not to the rest of it so you could uh, imagine boom the whole site down and then somebody sends me an email 
Can you explain me why the CIO's office was offline for some minutes and you uh, <laughs> during business hours? Uh, yeah, and... about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man. No, we should, a, we should, we yeah. should do another one. Uh, we should do something. Um, I've got a, I have a short list that I'm trying to work with, work through. But after that, like these are like the, 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 the short list I'm working through on the design series here is the 80, 20, right? Like what are the mm -hmm. big common use cases? Mm -hmm. Um, we should definitely revisit once we get through that. If people like it, if people want to see more of it, we should definitely make a whole other one about like, okay, what are the cool things? Like the features, the corner cases, the extra stuff that we can talk about. We should do a whole other one on that. So thanks for joining me today. Um, again, I'll put all of Dave's, David's contact info, uh, his his uh, birthday, his uh, uh, phone number. Oh, uh, yeah, his, <laughs> what, what, was the, what was the other thing? Your maiden's, uh, mother maiden's His maiden name. name and... His maiden name. I'll put that in the, in the context, <laughs> comments below. And uh, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, please let me know. Oh, here I am just like recording bad things uh just messing up by clicking on the anyway uh if you guys enjoyed this uh let me know in the comments uh below uh, let us know and uh yeah thanks for joining us